Hello and welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us. We are awaiting some more attendees, so we will be with you back shortly. Thanks for your patience. Hello and welcome to the webinar by Mojue, Integrating Employees and Leaders, a Project Management Approach. I am Prakya Bhatt, Customer Success Manager at Mojue and, and the moderator of today's session. Our guest panelist for the webinar is Dr. Clint Kendrick, Director M&A HR at Oracle, public speaker and thought leader of repute in the HR m and space. He has led the HR and employee experience work streams for dozens of mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, and investments. Clint believes the thoughtful integration of people and culture is key to realizing deal value. Thank you for joining us today. It will be a one hour session with 40 to 45 minutes for the presentation and the remaining time for the question and answers. If you have any questions during the session, please do type it out in the questions tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. We will address them post the presentation. Without further ado, delay, let us begin the session. Over to you, Dr. Clint. Great, thanks so much, Fraka. And good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's on the phone. So like Fraka said, my name is Clint Kendrick and I do have quite a bit of experience in the HR aspects of mergers and acquisitions. And I've worked in M&A all over the globe in, uh, I believe, 67 countries last time I counted. So um, as I talk through this, I'll be speaking as somebody who's got quite a bit of personal experience working through uh, people, leadership, and cultural integration. I'm also the chair of an HR M&A roundtable. And in addition to the work that I've done, I'm able to draw on the wisdom and experience of literally hundreds of colleagues and thousands of deals. So I'll try to bring that perspective to this conversation as well. During the time that we'll be spending today, I want to make sure that we address these four key issues. So we'll talk about how people, leadership, and culture drive deal value. I'm going to talk about how we can manage people, leadership, and culture risks as we work our way through the integration process. 
I'm going to have some lessons learned and best practices around project planning for communication and change management. And then finally, I'll be sharing a, a list of what I call worst practices for effective HR management and what we can learn from those about best practices. So I think we've all heard the statistics about the failures that happen with M&A. I've seen studies that point to a 50 to 80% failure rate for M&A. We know that leaders and managers leave as soon as their retention agreements expire. So companies invest a lot of money in these uh, acquisitions. And quite often, once the retention agreement goes and the leader or manager no longer has a financial incentive to remain, uh, they move on. They go do something else. And sometimes the value of that investment goes with them. In addition to leaders and managers, employees who are brought on through an acquisition are almost 10 times as likely to leave as employees who are hired in off the street. And there are some ways that we can help to mitigate that. In addition to the retention problems, there are significant issues with employee performance after an acquisition. Employees just aren't as productive. They're usually wondering what's going to happen with them and with their careers. And that can be really harmful to the productivity and profitability of the acquired organization. In worst cases, uh, the employees can even help to sabotage the business, or excuse me, work to sabotage the business. And we also see increases in accidents, uh, time off, people who simply just don't show up to work anymore and abandon their jobs. Um, we also see things like physical violence happening and other things after an acquisition that ends up with a, an uptick. Uh, for those companies that work in areas where there are labor unions and local law allows the company to either you know, recognize those unions or not, there's a, a definite increase. I see works councils formed all the time after uh, an acquisition is announced. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong during an acquisition. And I think the flip side of that is to really talk about how leaders drive value in the deal, how culture drives value in the deal, and how the people drive value in the deal. So if the people stay around and they're productive and they're profitable, it really helps the company that did the acquisition to move forward. And I find that that doesn't really depend on the kind of acquisition it is, whether it's an IP buy where a company is simply looking to add a patent portfolio or if it's a, um, a buy where you're really just looking at the talent. And in a case like that, where it's say an aqua hire or uh, the acquisition of some kind of employee related goodwill, uh, where the, the brand of an individual like Beats by Dr. Dre is something that uh, is brought to, uh, to the acquisition. So I wanna go ahead and just uh, move from this into a question about the worst M&A transaction ever. So we have a few participants here, and uh, if you'll go ahead and just type into the chat bar on the bottom right-hand corner, uh, what you think the worst M&A transaction ever was off of this list. So um, we've got four options. Uh, the first is the Bank of America and Countrywide Mortgage Merger. Uh, the second is Daimler-Benz and Chrysler. The third is Microsoft and Nokia. And the fourth is AOL and Time Warner. So we'll give just a moment for you to go ahead and type which deal you think is often characterized as the worst M&A transaction ever into the chat box. Just a couple of moments. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and reveal the answer now, and that is the America Online and Tom Warner merger. So this is uh, broadly held as the worst example of an M&A that's ever been done. And uh, I believe that the failure was in part a failure to effectively integrate leadership, people, and culture into the organization. So let's talk for a moment about what happened with that merger. Over the course of time, this, uh, this merger lost almost $100 billion in value. And there were some very large reasons that this happened. First off, 
uh, it was bad market timing. So not all of this can be attributed to the people in the organization. Uh, this was the time when things were switching from dial-up internet here in the United States uh, to the broadband revolution, where suddenly uh, everybody was, uh, you know, moving to, to DSL or to a cable-based internet service. So certainly there was market timing that is, uh, is to look at for at least some of this. But there were other significant issues with the people and cultural integration for this particular deal. Uh, there were stories that were told um, about the incentive plan for leaders in this uh, new combined organization, where uh, leaders were really only incentivized to produce inside their own division, inside their own organization. So on the Time Warner side of the house with uh, the magazines and uh, hardcover books that were part of their uh, Time Life Books division, for example, there were opportunities to move into digital content and to monetize that. But instead of taking advantage of those opportunities to sell more digital properties or to use the online platform to sell more books, the leaders in these organizations were really uh, picking their territory, staking out their turf, and not playing well with the rest of the organization. Uh, this led to just a bunch of missed opportunities. It, it also led to some not particularly productive working relationships between division heads uh, that made it very difficult for the organization uh, to move forward to capture a lot of the value that this mega merger promised. So how do we keep that from happening to us in our acquisitions? You know, I, I think it'd be hard to lose a hundred billion dollars, but I think that that's a good example of what can happen uh, when a large merger goes wrong. But I think that this gives us some lessons for our small mergers. And this risk assessment matrix is one tool that I use when I go through and look at the risk that happens inside uh, M&A. So if you look along the left-hand axis, you'll see probability. This, in my mind, is the likelihood that a particular event will happen, something that I'll uncover. So if I'm doing my diligence work, and on the next slide we'll talk about the things that I do in the diligence stage to look at an organization, uh, but if I'm doing my diligence work and I find out, for example, that an organization has high turnover, and I say to myself, okay, this organization we're acquiring has high turnover, you know, what's the likelihood that we're going to have enough people leave that it's going to impact operations? I can put it on this left-hand matrix, and for example, if I think it's likely, in my mind, that's uh, you know 75 to 85%. You can come up with whatever numbers work in your world. And then I look across the top and I look at the impact that's going to happen. And I say, okay, for me in HR, there are two types of impact that I typically look at. I look at financial impact, and that includes some operational issues. And I look at reputational impact. So if I have a bunch of people leave and I think there's going to be a, a major financial impact from the attrition, I go over into this box and I go, okay, it's a major impact that's likely to happen. And I, I see that that box is red. And because that's a red box, I'm actually going to work a, a retention plan into my uh, overall project plan for the acquisition. Let's say I look at another risk. It's a, a risk of litigation. And I've heard nothing about litigation. Uh, I've looked at the company's business practices and handbooks, and I feel like they're in a good defensive position if there's any kind of litigation that comes across. Usually I'll meet with uh, counsel on the deal, and they'll come to that same conclusion. Um, so if we think that litigation, for example, is unlikely, I'll come down to unlikely on the probability. Even if it's a major bit of litigation, that still shows up in the yellow. And so I don't feel like I need to manage anything. Uh, in my post-merger integration plan, the same way that I would the retention risk. And of course, sometimes those are flipped. If I buy a small firm uh, where I really don't think people are going to go very far as far as, uh, excuse me, as long as the founder stays around, well, then it's an unlikely event to happen, even though it would have major impact. Or if I think it's almost certain that there's some sort of litigation pending, it's a, you know, a work environment that might have some issues, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to go, okay, that's a major impact. It's almost certain that there's a lawsuit that's going to happen or some kind of audit. And then uh, I look at moving that information into my integration plan. So this is just a really handy little tool for looking at some of the people risks that come up. 
And here's a list of uh, common leadership people and culture risks and how I think about these as I go through the diligence process. I firmly believe that the diligence process is uh, really where I start to manage my integration plan. I know that there are certain activities that I need to take care of in an HR organization, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but here are the major areas I look at to shape that plan as I go through the diligence and, and discovery process. So of course I look at the financial impacts of this. So uh, these would be things like, are there underfunded pension liabilities or uh, are there unpaid but accrued employee entitlements that I need to take into account? So this is really the sort of thing where I'm going to sit down with somebody from the accounting organization or the finance organization. Uh, we might look at the, the financials together. I'm going to look at things like, you know, in the last few years, have payroll costs gone up in a way that makes sense for this workforce? Or, you know, what about benefits costs? What are the line items that I have here? What about their pensions? The second thing that I'm going to look at are operational risks. So in a deal that I did a couple of years ago, I was working for uh, uh, another large multinational company, and we purchased an organization that put together training materials uh, in a very, very heavily regulated environment. Well, this organization, when they needed to hire people, they would simply pick up the phone and they would call down to a local trade school, and they would find people from that trade school who were recommended by the staff and administrators, and the very next morning, they would have somebody on board ready to work, and usually a pretty qualified person. So that pick up the phone and hire somebody method, that worked particularly well for this organization. Um, they were hiring mostly students, so of course they had high turnover when those students moved on to what was next, and it was just part of the way that they did business. But when we moved that organization into this large multinational with a complicated way of hiring people, their time to hire went from literally one day or less, where they just picked up the phone, uh, to 45 days. And uh, that's because they had to run potential employees through a new process that was designed to ensure compliance, given the risk of a very large multinational organization. And of course, that was going to have an effect on operations. So I very much look at those kinds of operational risks as I go through a diligence process to make sure uh, that a change in the HR processes, and with a lot of larger companies, these changes are not negotiable, uh, that I can understand what these changes are going to do with this organization's ability uh, to work moving forward. The next thing I look at is compliance. So this is things like litigation possibility, like how the labor relations go, whether or not they're following local law. Uh, whether or not there are any kind of employment-related audits or other employment-related risks that I need to be concerned about. The next thing I look at is the leadership of the organization. And I do this, of course, in uh, connection with the sponsors of the acquisitions in my current role. And try to understand, you know, who those key leaders and influencers are in an organization. Uh, those people who could really make or break an acquisition. Uh, we want to understand what they bring to the table and how they're going to affect the rest of the employee population, uh, what their leadership style is and how we can expect to work together, what the transition plan for them is. Um, when employees come over, you know, leaders are really, really critical uh, to their being successful. If they can look and see an organizational leader who can help them make the transition, it just makes such an enormous difference. The next thing that I look at is culture. And when I think about culture, what I really mean is the way that things get done. And so when I compare the culture of an organization that uh, we're acquiring to our culture, I can begin to understand where there might be some challenges integrating uh, the two cultures together. Uh, in some organizations, I think, or excuse me, some acquisitions, I think that the integration of culture uh, is more important than others. I, I don't think it's always of equal importance. It's going to depend a lot on the integration model and uh, really the business unit that we're moving an acquired company into, how large it is, um, and the size of the acquired culture. But when we look at studies by CEOs, this is one of their biggest reasons that they cite failure in M&A is culture clash. So we really want to be on top of that as we move through. 
And then the last thing that I'm looking at is the HR function and how the HR organization inside the acquisition does business. How do they support the employees? What are their policies and procedures like? And how different is that going to be for the, the employee experience coming in? So I look across all of these areas. I have some checklists and tools that I use. I know which experts I'm going to draw on. And then I go back to my probability impact matrix that I just shared, and I plot those risks on the chart so that I understand what I'm really managing to. And then I have to figure out, okay, how am I going to manage that risk as we go through the integration? One of the risks that we often manage is the people change, and that can cross all of these. So we'll come up with a change in communications plan, and I'm gonna talk specifically about how we work the change in communications plan in a moment, but first we have another question. So I'll give you just a moment or two to go ahead and answer this uh, again in the chat box. Uh, and this is how many times does an employee need to hear key messages before they, they sort of get it, before they understand it? And our choices are three, five, seven, or nine. So I'll give you a moment to go ahead and, and message those to me in the chat box. Okay, so for those of you that have taken a, a marketing class, you've probably heard about the rule of sevens. And this is the idea that in order for a consumer of information to hear a message, uh, that they need to hear that message seven different times. And, uh, you know, I keep getting reminded of this every time I do an acquisition. Um, in my current role, we just announced that we were uh, doing a, a buy. I was on the phone with one of the leaders of this company that we've been working with since last year uh, on this particular transaction. And uh, he said, hey, where do I find that benefits information again? One of my team members is asking. Well, we've sent out the information on where to find benefits a bunch of times. You know, we, we sent it out in an FAQ document. I've talked about it a bunch of times during face-to-face -face meetings as we're bringing employees across. Uh, we send them emails with links. We uh, have done uh, town hall meetings where we talk about the benefits. And I was still getting asked, hey, where do I find this information? And it just reminded me how important it is to repeat critical messages again and again and again especially in an M&A environment, because the employees are just going through so much that they really don't know what information they need until the moment they need it. So it's just critically important for us to provide them opportunities to get information as we go forward. And having a solid communication plan helps that. So I'm gonna talk for a minute about what phases of an acquisition or what phases of the employee experience require different kinds of communication. So the first thing that starts to happen before a transaction is announced is there's usually some kind of information leak, some kind of rumor mill that begins. And so uh, the employees begin to speculate on what's going on. And uh, those of us who have dealt with other people, we know that when employees start to wonder what's going on, they're usually not thinking about how fantastic it's going to be. You know, they're not usually excited about the possibility that they might be bought or that there might be some sort of reorg. You know, usually they're very, very nervous about what's going on, uh, and they start to think about the worst case scenario. And usually at this phase, we're, we're honestly not really able to share a lot of information with them, but we can at least understand that the rumor mill is starting to move. The next thing that happens is the transactions announced and the employees really start to look inside their organization to understand what's going on. They know that their reality is shifting and they start to try and understand what this change in their reality really means to them uh, and what they're going to be able to do with their careers and how they're going to take care of their families. Once the acquisition is closed, the employees will often get a sense that there's been some sort of takeover, and this makes them really nervous as well. Uh, obviously, this entire process is not comfortable for employees who are used to having uh, something steady, something solid going on. This is very different than what's going on with the leaders, the people who sold the company or uh, you know, helped in the pre-deal stages. You know, they've gotten used to the idea. They initiated the sale in a lot of cases, but the employees who work for them haven't. And so I've found that there's 
candidly, uh, a fairly large disconnect between the selling leadership and their employees. Uh, the leaders in the organization being sold will really not understand what the employees are going through and the lack of control those employees feel until this point when the employees start to get fairly uh, vocal about how nervous they are. Um, there end up being these cross-organizational things that start to happen. People start to look at where am I going to sit? Where am I going to work? Who am I going to report to? You know, what are my benefits? And this is when leaders of these companies that are being sold begin to really understand what's going on in their employees' minds. If we start to get in front of these concerns um, earlier down the road as we um, announce the transaction and talk about these changes, we tend to find less problems from the employees, less of those consequences that I spoke about at the beginning with the lower engagement, lower morale, lower productivity. Um, we, we find fewer problems if we get out in front of the communication. Um, and then finally, the new normal sets in. Uh, this does take a little bit of time for the employees to go through the full breadth of the employee experience until this becomes uh, really their new normal. They may or may not like it. Uh, I was with an organization for a number of years that had been through a very, very large merger. And um, you would still hear 15 years after the merger, you would still hear people that were so identified with one of the legacy companies that they they really hadn't moved on in their heads. And some people won't move on, but uh, the bulk of the employees will. I find that as employees move through this process, they're really asking themselves three big questions. And as we work on a communications plan, uh, we need to answer these questions, and we'll probably need to answer them in slightly different ways at each phase of the transaction. Uh, the first one is really a question about economic security. And this question, you know, really looks to the employee like, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to pay my mortgage? Am I going to be able to feed my kids? Am I going to be able to go to the doctor for any kind of healthcare concerns that I have? So it's a question about economic stability. Am I going to be okay financially? And to the degree that we can answer that question uh, as we work through the process, the, the better off we'll be. Uh, the second question that employees have once they either understand that they're going to have a job or that there are still some plans in work is really about fairness. Uh, they're asking, is this new organization going to be fair to me? They understand that the rules are going to have to change. They understand that uh, their role in this new organization will be different. And now they're wondering, you know, will you be fair? Is there going to be what we call procedural justice? Oh, sorry about that. Slipped out of the view there. Okay. And then finally, the next question they're going to ask is, will my job be as good? And that's a really subjective question, but it's one that the employees will ask. Uh, I was working on an acquisition, and I had an employee uh, break down and cry in my office. You know, um, she had been offered a position with the company I was working for. And um, she did not feel like the job was as good. Uh, at the small startup, she was a director level. With us, she was an individual contributor. Um, you know, the, the titles just didn't line up. And uh, she was expecting some sort of large payout because she had equity in the company being sold. Well, that company was underwater, which often happens with startups. So she wasn't receiving this huge payout that she'd been working overtime hours for, you know, months and years to earn. And so you know, she really had a big breakdown with this, this particular issue. You know, she didn't feel like the job was going to be as good. And of course, that affected her productivity uh, when she transitioned over and didn't last very long because of this emotional response, which is unfortunate because I really think she would have added a lot of value to the organization. But she left on this, will my job be as good question. And I think if uh, that had been a more critical employee to the success of this acquisition, uh, that you know, it would have been a, a much bigger loss and something that would have been felt much harder. And we've all seen that in organizations where it's more key or critical people who have these reactions and then move on. So if we can answer these three big questions through our communications plan, or at least the, the questions that lead to these three concerns, then we're in much better shape. So there are a couple of elements of a strong communication plan that I believe we can bake into the timeline for the plan. You know, the first is that we want to do timely and frequent messaging to employees. 
What does that look like? When I say timely, I mean we get employees the information that they need when they need it. Uh, they're going through a lot of change, but different employees are really going to have different concerns. And so, uh, like I mentioned earlier, with benefits information, for somebody who has a, a child or uh, their own personal uh, health care challenges, like uh, you know, we've done acquisitions where uh, the daughter of an employee had leukemia, uh, for example, uh, that was a, a huge concern. So we got that information to them just in time, let people know what was going to be going on with that. Uh, and then we frequently communicated that same message around healthcare in that deal. In other transactions, the concerns are a, a little less scary than leukemia, but we do see other kinds of concerns about you know, a facility move, or they know that there might be some sort of layoffs going on. And so we try to answer those questions uh, in a timely fashion. The one thing I do want to say about the timely and frequent communication is that there, there have been a number of recent studies in this era where we talk a lot about fake news. And what's really disturbing about these studies is that um, people tend to lock into the first thing they hear, whether or not that thing is accurate. So um, the researchers have done some studies where they've given people news articles and uh, those news articles had falsehoods in them. And the people knew that they had false information in the article. But when they were tested on it, they repeated the fake information just like they did the more accurate information in the story. And no matter how many times that was corrected, when they went to test those people on the knowledge from the article, they remembered the first thing they heard, even if it was wrong. So that makes it more important for us to go ahead and share accurate information up front, because once the employees start to hear things through the rumor mill, they're going to believe the rumor mill that they heard simply because it was the first item that hit their attention. The second thing that's important is to have a tone of empathy, and that looks like understanding where the employees are. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we'll rely on an acquired company leader to share key messages about the acquisition. And I think that's an important thing to do. We'll talk about having a trusted messenger next, but I often find I need to train them on empathy um, to remind them that they're the ones that initiated the sale of their business, that they're the ones who wanted this, and a lot of times their employees did not. And so they need to have a little more empathy for the employee population and understand that the employees just really aren't quite where they are. I also need to coach uh, managers of the organization that done the acquisition, the buying company, to really understand that, yeah, we're, we want to buy these guys. That doesn't mean that they want to be uh, brought on through an acquisition. And then finally, the trusted messenger uh, is just so important here. And usually that's somebody coming out of the company that's being purchased, who the employees trust, who the employees are willing to give an opportunity to. And having that uh, consistent messaging from somebody the employees trust is really critical. And I bake all of these things into my project plan, the timely and frequent, the empathetic tone. So I look at key messages that I want to deliver when I put together my communications project plan. And I also look at who I assign that to, who is a trusted messenger. So we've talked specifically about communications, but let's talk about general project management for a moment. And so again, in the chat box, if you want to go ahead and answer this question, uh, this is a statistic from PMI, the Project Management Institute. And the question is, for every billion dollars companies in the U.S. invest, how much of that money is wasted due to poor project performance? And our choices are uh, 61 million, 122 million, 244 million, and 488 million. So I'll let you go ahead and send those to me via chat. Okay, and the answer is 122 million. So that's about 12% of the value that's wasted in uh, these billions of dollars in investments companies are making. And uh, we should be really clear that uh, an M&A integration is a project and it does need to be managed well. So just a, a thought from Ben Franklin, I think we've all heard this, if we fail to plan, we're planning to fail. And I find that that's really true in the M&A context, that 
if we don't go in with a solid integration plan, uh, then it's really going to cause problems down the road. I've worked on a couple of deals where uh, the company wanted to go ahead and make a purchase, but they weren't sure quite what they were going to do. They knew that it fit into a strategic product portfolio or a strategic uh, IP portfolio, but they weren't quite sure what was going to happen after we did the purchase and weren't really willing to commit up front to a course of action. And that ends up being very challenging. And uh, I find that those tend to be far less successful, both in terms of the employee experience uh, and in terms of the actual dollar value gained out of the deal. For HR, here are some of the major areas where we do integration planning. So, of course, we're responsible for making sure that HR services get delivered. Um, so, you know, this is how are we going to get HR people deployed to these employees? What are we going to do there? Uh, what are we going to do with the total rewards? That means changes to comp, to benefits, uh, to any kind of equity or change in control provisions. Uh, what are we going to do with the organization design? What's going to happen with the leaders? Where are they going to go? Uh, what's going to happen with the workforce? Are we going to do reductions? Are we going to be adding heads? Can we move people around? Um, how do we manage talent in this new organization? What are we going to do about retention? Uh, how are we going to identify those people that we have to have stick around to continue to get value out of the deal? And what are the monetary and non-monetary retentive factors that we want to look at? Um, we've already talked about communication, key messages, and change management. And then finally, when we look at culture, which has significant impacts on employee engagement, which in turn affects productivity and profitability, um, and really the question of how work gets done. Uh, and that looks like things like not only HR systems, but procurement. Uh, I once did an acquisition where there were some prototyping being done by the company we acquired. When a prototype needed to happen, the vice president of engineering would take his personal credit card. He would go down to the local auto parts store. He would order the pieces he needed. He'd pick them up the next day um, or a couple of days later, and they'd add it into their prototype. Well, large company comes in and you can no longer do that kind of thing. It's not an HR issue. HR doesn't manage how we procure things, but it's certainly an employee experience issue and a business issue when you can no longer produce your prototype in a couple of days, but you've got to wait for weeks for a particular supplier to come on and for your uh, supplier management organization to figure out how to get these parts that you used to be able to get in 48 to 72 hours. So when I look at culture and how work gets done, it really isn't limited to just HR matters. So I wanna go ahead and, and uh, wrap up my section of this by talking about a couple of project management worst practices. And when I look at these worst practices, these are mistakes that I've made, that I've seen others made, that hopefully we've learned to correct over time. Um, I don't make these as much as I used to, but I know things are going a little bit off the rails when I find myself doing one of these six things. So uh, the first is not knowing where you're going. So we've already talked about the need for a solid integration plan and to really understand where the project's headed. Uh, there's a saying in the world of Six Sigma, which is begin with the end in mind. And I really try to do that when I'm putting together my HR project plans. Uh, the second worst practice is to frequently change the plan. Uh, there's nothing like getting a team aligned around a specific direction and then suddenly saying, no, we're going to go this way, or there's been a change, we're going to go that way. And I think we all know that change is inevitable, that things are going to look different. Uh, uh, as we work through a deal versus the baseline plan that we create, but to the degree that we can minimize the changes to the plan, uh, the better off we are, especially in a complicated plan with a lot of interdependencies where uh, people are relying on your part of the plan or you're relying on their part of the plan to have things come together at the right time in the right place in the right manner. Uh, changing the plan just makes that so much harder to do. Uh, the third is pretending that people aren't complicated. And even though I work in HR, every once in a while I make the mistake of assuming that something having to do with people is going to be easy. And I'm almost always finding that to be an assumption error. So I recently worked on a deal where we wanted to get to a certain milestone uh, within a couple of months for a process that usually takes three to four months. We gave ourselves six weeks. And 
we just ignored the complexity of people as we did this. So, you know, there were certain milestones that needed to be hit. For example, employees returning their new offers of employment to us. And uh, the way that we had to work this timeline to meet the business objectives, it gave us no room for people negotiating their offers or for people to say no or for people to have really complicated questions. And, uh, you know, we ended up readjusting some things and doing things not as well as we would have liked to because we were uh, ignoring the complexity of people and their issues. Had we thought a little bit more about this or if we'd had more time, we would have baked additional time into that process instead of cutting it short. And we would have had fewer emergencies to deal with. Uh, the next is assuming the best case scenario. So this is uh, very closely related in HR at least to uh, people complexity. But I do see it in other functions where uh, you'll rely on a, a vendor to do some kind of analysis. Uh, for us, it's often law firms that will have to do some kind of analysis. And uh, it may not come back on time. And so, you know, if we don't get things back on time, it causes delays downstream. So by assuming the best case, which is, oh, you know, that attorney will get all the documents that they need to do their review to get it back to us in time to do our next steps, it ends up creating uh, some challenges if we don't build Slack time in. Uh, the next item is prioritizing emergencies. And this is such an easy one to do, uh, at least in some organizations, where the big fire that comes up is probably not the most important thing that's happened. So um, I'll find this a lot from integration management offices where there will be some kind of employee who feels like they haven't gotten the information they need or they don't like their offer and they'll just raise a, a fuss. And all of a sudden, everybody's focus is now on this one employee who's not happy, who probably will never be happy and who I'm not gonna be able to make happy, but they're now the person that I am spending most of my time with uh, when my team should be focused on other parts of this integration. We're focused on this one person who's made a lot of noise. And I find that that will occasionally knock a project plan off course, uh, just one or two, emergent issues where there's something very loud that attracts a lot of attention and I'm not working on the important things that need to happen. So it really is critical to strike that balance. Uh, and then finally, the need to know everything. So this is one of those things where I really acknowledge that I need to rely on the expertise of others as I work my way through a project. And understanding that the expertise of others can be really, really valuable in getting things done well, getting them done uh, effectively is hugely critical. So that's the end of, uh, of my portion of this. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Praka to talk a little bit about our sponsor for this webinar. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation, uh, Dr. Clint. Uh, reiterating on your point, m and &E and integration failures are essentially project management failures. The lack of an effective planning and a single platform for global teams to work together has been a fundamental reason behind most m and failures of our time. Technology and automation is changing the global arena in unprecedented ways. m and is no exception. Majuel's SaaS platform is therefore built in providing companies to go through m and with an armor to help sustain the cumbersome and tedious business process and accelerate deal cycles. It provides within the platform integration planning to track and ensure synergy creation. All the information is centralized in one area, making management of the deal easier and the tracking of post acquisition performance, reporting and bringing transparency and communication, as we know, are very essential armors for deal success. On the next slide, we see talk about what are the key features of MergerWare? MergerWare integrates most m and activities by providing an m and process playbook, an integration management office for the integration manager to view all items on a single window, risk and issue tracking, helping avert risks well in advance before they pose a problem, a dashboard for the senior management to get a bird eye view on the progress of the deal. MergerWare is therefore, uh, on next slide, we, 
we see exactly what Mojoware brings in as a value proposition in comparison to all the issues that and are the current m and &E challenges we face today. There is a lack of standardization of m and &E processes within many firms, lack of security and confidentiality, lack of visibility as the deals progress, and difficulty to track deal performance without a centralized platform. Mergerware answers these questions pretty clearly by providing a configurable m and &E process template inbuilt within the platform, world-class data security, as we know, data is a big issue and can cause severe problems during and after the deal cycles. Real-time information provided during the deal life cycle, comparative set of indicators which helps in the business planning and checking out the acquisition performance. Basically, a unified platform which helps deal with all M&A deals by simplifying PMI and helping customers derive value from all their M&A deals. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clint will now be addressing the questions. Uh, if you have any questions, you can still drop it in the control panel while we address the ones we have already received. Uh, so I will just be mentioning the first one. Uh, Dr. Clint, you mentioned leadership and culture as a risk factor you look at due, during due diligence. Uh, what are some of the ways you try to understand the leadership and culture of a target company in your experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of times we're asked about how, how does one do diligence on uh, an organization's culture and, and leadership? And I find that there's a, a few ways to do this, uh, and it depends on where we are in a transaction. So. Uh, obviously, before a deal is announced, we have a limited group of people that we can talk to, and that's that uh, company's leadership. So we try to understand from the company leadership how they perceive the culture of the organization. Um, I also look for public information sources. So um, I'll go ahead and take a look at the news about a company, if they've got any news. I'll look at their reviews on websites like glassdoor.com or um, you know, other job review websites that are out there where we can get some information on the employees, uh, perceptions of the company uh, and the company's leaders. As we move through after a deal is announced, um, it's helpful to just talk to the employees and ask them questions. And uh, when I say ask them questions, I'm not saying tell me about the culture of your organization because that's not that doesn't give me particularly useful information, but ask very specific questions about how work gets done. Things like, you know, how are decisions made? How is information communicated? Um, th that I ask directly of the employees so we get a sense of what's going on. Um, you know, what are your big concerns about this acquisition, which will help us to shape the change plan and also give us a sense of the culture. Um, sometimes we'll do surveys and focus groups as we work our way through the acquisition, but again, that's further down the road. Um, but up front, usually I'm looking for public information, I'm talking to key leaders, and I'm also talking to people at the acquiring company who have relationships with the target. So a lot of times a, a target company will have worked with us fairly closely already, and we'll have some insights on our end as well. And uh, I find it very helpful to not overlook those. I, I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Dr. Clint. We have another question. Uh, you talked about three big question employees have joining ME. Uh, would you think, uh, would you tell these employees that the deal might lead to layoffs? Yeah, so uh, when when there's likely to be layoffs in a deal, and uh, you know it does happen, uh, especially with back office people, um, one of the most unfortunate parts of my job is looking at other HR people and trying to figure out, you know, what we're going to do with them, um, you know, what kind of employment opportunities they'll have. Uh, it, it's hard conversations to have, but I think that it's important to have any kind of conversation about um, redundancies or layoffs, or you know, sometimes we call them synergies. Uh, as directly as possible. Uh, I, we want to make sure that we use that em empathetic tone, uh, that we're really showing compassion to employees, but we also need to be really honest. If there's going to be some sort of reorganization or restructuring, um, you know, I think we owe it to employees to let them know uh, that there may be some headcount reductions and that impacted people 
you know, we'll be supported with, uh, you know, severance or we'll help them with job hunting or we'll try to find them other positions in the organization. I find that that's just so much more respectful than telling people that nothing's going to happen. And then even worse, if we tell uh, a broad group of employees that nothing's going to happen, that nothing's going to change, that everybody will have the same job in a year, um, and then you do layoffs, then the employees now see you as a liar and they're not gonna trust anything that you say. So I think it's important to get out in front of any kind of layoffs with clear communication uh, and to make sure that uh, we're communicating those things in a respectful and accurate way with the best information that we have available at the time. And if we don't have that information, I think it's very fair to say, you know, we're still looking into that. Um, it's a possibility you know, or, or no, actually, we're not gonna do any layoffs as part of this transaction. Um, if we know what the information is, but never say no, it's not going to happen if we think it's going to happen because that, that destroys trust that those employees have. Okay, we have another last question. Um, when managing a project, how do you balance taking care of emergencies and managing the larger project? Yeah, so you know that that saying about the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We we tend to have a lot of uh, a lot of squeaky wheels that pop up, and f I'm fortunate enough right now to have a really good team that works for me. And so what I'm able to do is determine the level of attention that uh, that emergency really needs. And if it's something I need to attend to it, I go ahead and attend to it. But I give responsibility for managing the overall movement of the project to my team. And it's just part of what I need to do to be a competent project manager is look at what needs my attention right now, while also making sure that the major parts of the project are moving forward through people that are competent to do that kind of work. Um, it, it is certainly a balancing act trying to decide you know, when the emergency should take priority and when it shouldn't. Um, but I do think that that's an important skill that comes with experience. And it's really helpful to have a very good team uh, working with you so that uh, emergencies can be handled by the right level of person while the rest of the team helps keep the broader project moving forward. Okay. Um, that's all of the questions we have for now. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Clint, for the presentation and your valuable time. This has indeed been very educative, and I'm sure the attendees have the same feeling. Thank you to the attendees for joining us on this webinar, and we hope to see you again on the upcoming webinars of MergerWare. Thank you. Have a great day.